Hi everyone, welcome to eLearn Chat, where talk is knowledge. Today we've got Clark Quinn, here we go. Hi everyone, welcome to eLearn Chat, where talk, it's knowledge. Today we've got um, no real co-host, but we have Leva Weimais, also known as Lilyberry, who is helping with the chat room. We, uh, Dawn could not, somebody just left, I think. Um, Dawn could not uh, make it today, and um, she's on vacation. Lisa is stuck in a business meeting. And we had Kirsten, who's at the dentist. So we three, three, three of the rotating co-hosts gone, and, and we couldn't get Trisha Ransom to wake up early today. So here we are. <laughs> it's just us, and I think we just lost uh, Leva. It looks like she got disconnected. Um, so hopefully she doesn't call back in, because if she does, it's going to cause a little grief. But anyway, uh, with us today, we've got Clark Quinn from Quinnovation. Hi, Clark. How are you today? Uh, doing pretty good. How are you doing, Rick? I am doing great. And you've been a busy man. You've been doing all sorts of good things. Uh, tell us about your new book coming out. Um, well, I have to tell you that I didn't intend to be a revolutionary, but I couldn't uh, continue to watch what was happening in the industry and not decide that it was time to have to do something. Uh, and so I looked at what was happening and realized what, in short, what L&D, by and large, is, is not doing near what it could and should be, and what it is doing is doing badly. And <laughs> I just don't think that's a good state of affairs, and I felt it was time to try and not just call it out, but try and point to some elements that we need to look at, talk about what it would look like if we were doing it better, and try and help people with a roadmap forward. And it, it's... You know, too early to have all the answers, but there's a lot of information, evidence, and, and opportunities already there that we're trying to take advantage of. Yeah, and and you're talking about the the book or the the serious e learning manifesto? Yes. <laughs> yes, it's both. <laughs> well, the state of the industry is 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 bad at both levels. They're just at different levels. So the other thing you're referring to, Rick, is the serious e learning manifesto, which yep. is. Um, an initiative that I'm not doing alone, but in fact with Michael Allen and Julie Dirksen and Will Tallheimer, we were upset with the state of e-learning, the state of formal e-learning. Mm -hmm. And similarly, we're walking around the expo floor and bemoaning the fact that things hadn't changed in 10 years while there was, you know, different window dressing, the underlying concepts hadn't advanced. And so we felt that there was a real important, uh, you know, well, we wondered what we could do. We couldn't stand by and not do anything. And so we came together and came up with what we called the e-learning manifesto, the series e-learning manifesto that we launched a few weeks ago. And we're trying to get people to sign on. And there's eight core values we really believe are sort of what's missing in the way we're shifting and thinking about our formal learning. And then there's the uh, 22 principles research based on research and, and deep thought and work of bunches of people over the decades around the world. Uh, this is just us collating it together to try and say, hey, pay attention. And we want people to sign on and start trying to put it into practice. So that's just the formal learning level, which can definitely be improved and is a starting point. But the Revolutionized uh, Learning and Development book is... Um, the bigger picture. It starts saying, you know, yes, formal learning needs to be better, but it's not the only thing we can and should be doing. We should be looking to performance support. We should be looking to the network, the power of people. We should be pulling all this together into a coherent whole. And in fact, we tend to use courses as the only solution when it's actually should be used somewhat rarely. And when it is used, it should be done very well. So we want to, you know, the, the, point of the bigger book of the, is the more overarching picture of putting all those elements together into a coherent whole and then getting the elements underneath it right, the foundations of the infrastructure. You know, it's it, trying to have one all singing, all dancing tool that will do everything just doesn't make sense. You need to have a strategy about where you're going and where you're trying to get to and, you know, 
what are the steps that are going to get there that build upon one another and how you're going to measure it and see if you're making progress and the th third foundational element is the culture you have to have a culture where um, people can work and play well together if it's not safe to participate what I call the Miranda organization you know the Miranda organization where anything you say can and will be used against you <laughs> I mean <laughs> companies aren't going to work when they're have that sort of uh, right. atmosphere in which to to work you know it brings up a point that and I've been saying this for years that most companies don't train because they want to they train because they have to so so as a result you wind up with training that more often than not, it's pretty lackluster, pretty non-engaging, pretty boring, uh, and and even worse, rarely trains anybody. <laughs> so it's well, that, <laughs> that's absolutely right, Rick. And you know, so we're using training as the only tool in our toolbox, and yet training works when there's a skill shift. But if you go out and do a, a performance analysis, you might find the gap is just knowledge, hmm. and we could be using performance support. It may be something that's too unique or too changing too rapidly to be worth trying to make a course about. Um, and we should be looking to the network to, to provide those solutions. And yet, everything is a course. And people become order takers. I need a course on this. OK, I'll create a course on this. And yet, that course may not be the right answer. And you're beginning to see forward-thinking organizations beginning to start resisting that and saying, let's go out and find out what the real problem is. What, are you, what needle are you trying to move? And let's figure out how we're going to move that. And so. We have bad training. We only use training, even though there's other solutions. And this is very much part of the problem. Our goals, what organizations need, you know, training addresses optimal execution. We're trying to get people able to do things perfectly, but that's just going to be the cost of entry in this day and era of increasing change. You're going to need continual innovation as a sustainable differentiator for organizations, and that doesn't come from training. That comes from creative friction in people interacting with one another and in a, again, a, a optimal atmosphere, a culture where people contribute. And when you link those two together, that's when you have what an organization can and should be. And that's a role that L&D can really be playing that's going to move it from that little cost center over to the side that's first thing to get cut to a really core responsibility across the entire organization. So, so are you saying that social learning is, is something that we haven't, I mean, everybody learns socially to a point, but, but a more organized social learning is probably one of the things that we need to implement? Absolutely, Rick. Uh, you know, it's, we, some have argued that all learning is social when we're reading books by other people, you know, they're communicating to us too. Um, but now we have the power of using technology to support social learning and make it more effective, effective and give us new capabilities that we didn't have in our previous conversations. So using social media to facilitate social learning is exactly what we're talking about. That we can, we understand it now. We have much better awareness of how we work and play together and how, what that looks like when it's going well and what it looks like when it's not going well. And there, there is the opportunity to put that into place. There is the opportunity to structure our organization and our infrastructure and our work processes to take advantage of people thinking together. You've heard the old canard, the room is smarter than the smartest person in the room. And that's true if you manage the process right and have the infrastructure there. But you really have to get those elements right. But when you do the power that is on tap, is immense. So what, what do you think it all fell apart? Because I, I remember, if nothing else, about 14 years ago, maybe a little earlier or a little later, but somewhere in, around 2000, 2001 is where we noticed the tools got lighter, the, um, the people working the tools weren't really qualified to work the tools. They were doing the best they could with what they had. And, and, and the trend seems to have been spiraling downwards ever since, where the quality of training has really gone bad. Um, and that's, in, that's at least in the e-learning side of it. Even instructor-led training a lot of times is, is kicked out really quickly uh, on a need-to-know basis almost. Where, where do you think things went bad aside from economies and things like that? Well, actually, I think it is economies that was the, the pressure for the change you're talking about. Because, you know, the awareness in the internet community 
uh, Tim O'Reilly talking about Web 2.0, the power of user-generated content, and uh, the Clue Train Manifesto talking about markets are now conversations. This is what's on tap, and yet we haven't seen the organizations. Why? I think that the economic crisis you're talking about cause companies to look for ways to reduce costs on doing things. And so they look to e-learning as a way to reduce costs. And they took, you know, we're still using industrial age methods uh, in, in organizational learning in many ways. You know, put people in a room, give them a bunch of information, and then send it back out and think this is going to lead to any difference. Right. We, it got easy to, to get information to people and then to test that information. And similarly, one of the things we now know is that subject matter experts have no access to what they actually do. Seventy percent of what they do is unaware, uh, inaccessible to them, and you have to go through extreme processes. But we, in the interest of speed, we work with them, get their information out, they give it to us really quickly, we get it up there really quickly, we had a test really quickly, we get it out to the market really quickly. Problem is we're not evaluating what we're doing. Right. We're looking at how much, do, how much does it cost us to get it out there and put a person in to spend an hour in a seat. Which is, you know, once you know that that hour on a seat's valuable, making that efficient is great. But we're not checking to see if it's valuable. And I will suggest that a lot of the time we're having people spend in seats in whether it's e-learning or training is just wasted. It just oh. so quickly we do this event-based model. And yet because of the economic pressures from 2000 on for the past decade and more, people have gone to that because it's cost justifiable right and there's this collective insanity going on well, you, you're, so you're, okay. and you're absolutely right a lot of the fortune 500 companies have very expensive lms's but they don't do very much in the in the form of analytics of of qualitative analysis you know what have we learned has anybody actually improved from the has performance improved can we tie it back to uh to any kind of hr roles any kind of um cookbook type performance can can you say oh you know this person took all of these courses what have they done with it not really uh, in fact I'm, I've always been shocked that you know people will spend half a million dollars on an LMS and it launches courses and that's about it they have other capabilities but nobody uses them because that takes more time people and money so you have a launching course tool it doesn't <laughs> do a heck of a lot and it just it is mind-boggling and first of all to spend that much money on an lms um second to not use it for what it can actually do um that's a, that's i think one of the big problems with training on the whole and that's whether it's instructor-led or or e-learning people aren't really looking to see is it making things better can we tell um is the organization growing because of this is the bottom line being improved um and i'm not sure what the solution is or how to how to get that going you know, one, th one thing I really liked about the e-learning manifesto is that, yes, it's all about change. It's about making change and making it better. The hard part of that is most companies just don't want to spend the money on it because it does cost more to make better training. Um, you know, you, you can write better, and that's another skill set in and of itself that has to be improved upon. But the thing is, the money, a lot of companies say, you know what, I know, I don't care. And how, do you, how do you work around that one? Well, I want to challenge one thing you said, Rick, mm -hmm. and I agree with the large part of it, but the one thing where it said, you know, better learning take, costs more, takes longer. Actually, in that's only marginally true because you still have to understand, create, you know, an objective and you still have to create an assessment and you still have to sure. align content resources to do that. But you need to think differently about it. Um, so I wrote a post about how to start implementing the manifesto because we think a couple of the barriers are just that measurement you're talking about and LMSs mm -hmm. don't support it in fact calling them LMSs is, is kind of silly they're they're not learning management systems you can't manage learning right. they're course management systems yes. and as you said course launching systems um, but we could have better courses and it really doesn't take longer I wrote an article on that once in an editorial it, you you just have to change the way you think about it you still have to do the same amount of work it's just you need to come at it from a different perspective and yeah there'll be a, a marginal bit of work because you really need more practice than we're doing we have this bad habit of doing practice until they get it right instead of until they can't get it wrong and <laughs> that's just not going to lead to any yeah. meaningful change right um, so instead we need to um, we can do better learning and that's what the serious learning manifesto is but that it's 
not going to get driven until we start connecting what we do to the business units, to their measurements. And that's been the barrier is the LMS can measure all this amount of time and seat and, you know, and we can track the cost to get the course hosted there. But we're going to have to break out of our silos. We're going to have to start going out and talking to the business units to get their data to do this. And the opportunity is when they come to us and say, I need a course on X or a course on Y, that's the opportunity to say, well, what, what do you think that's going to impact? And it's a challenge. You have to talk more sensibly. But if we're going to be business people, we have to be willing to take have business conversations. Mm -hmm. And if we're not being business people, we really have a right to be just severed from the organization at the first sign of economic hardship. Until we're willing to actually contribute to what the organization is trying to achieve, we aren't, we're not even a nice to have. <laughs> we're just a, we're just a parasite uh, to be a little bit. Uh, you know, for, for years, I've been saying that it, it's basically the same thing you're saying is for learning and training in an organization to survive, they have to go operational. Many times they're under the wrong departments. They're not where either money's being made or where things are produced. So as a result, they're distanced from the people who actually do the operations in a company whether they're manufacturing, distribution, financial, insurance, whatever, whatever industry, they're removed from, from actually the cost center, well, actually the profit centers. They're stuck in cost centers, and therefore they're not looked at as important. They're looked at as, oh, we've got to spend money on this. Um, whereas if you put them in operations, more often than not, the training is much more useful uh, because now it's got a goal. They've got to train certain things that they know versus kind of a, a, a far off goal of saying we need to do this, this and this, but no real idea operationally why they're doing it. Well, I think that's right. I think the most effective organizations are the ones that are in cost center, I mean in, in profit centers. Mm -hmm. So the customer care training and the sales right. training and the product training people tend to be, you know, product training oftentimes has people doing hands on training with things. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't work, the customers get upset, so they have a nice tight loop. The people who are talking about the new economy are arguing that the customer, you know, customer satisfaction is the most important metric of an organization. Um, and when that happens, well, you're driven to to achieve important goals. And so, um, uh, I'd really uh, like to suggest that we must become, as you say, tied. And you know, when we're not. That's where we end up perpetuating myths like generations and learning styles and mm -hmm. things that are, you know, <laughs> that are just research debunked and yet continue to pervade because we end up not being driven by important numbers. We end up being driven by mythologies. Now, now you mentioned mythology, generational. Are you saying that generational learning is a mythology or? Um, I'm st well, yes. Um, not generational learning, but you know, HR tends to say we need to te treat people different right. by these different uh, generations, right. which mm -hmm. really is uh, discrimination, frankly. <laughs> yeah. Instead yeah. of knowing who a person is by what they do and what they, how hard they work and how what skills they have, we're trying to say, oh, just because of their age, that defines them. That's crazy. Right. You know, my kids still come to me for technology support in many cases. Um, it's it depends on how much experience you have. That's what matters. Um, there, and they've done evidence about what people care about in the workplace, and it doesn't differ by age. No statistically significant difference. And that stuff about, oh, well, we have to do games for millennials because that's the only way they learn. Games are, when done right, are better learning for everybody. You know, it's not about generations. It's about our wetware. And our and, wetware hasn't changed by the generations. And, and it's interesting. There's a strange phenomenon going on in the industry right now where people are considering gamification a set of questions. I, I've seen this a lot where people say, we're creating a game for our training. It's 50 questions. <laughs> That's tarted up drill and kill. Uh, uh, and um, it, there are times when we do have to know things certain dead cold, like vocabulary, we need to have it. Mm -hmm. And you know, you don't want the doctor sure. uh, taking your knee off <laughs> when it's your elbow that's the problem because you've got the wrong language. But by and large, the skills to do that surgery, I want them to have practiced that in simulations right before they ever do it live and then I want to do it live scaffolded and this is bridging the gap between you know formal and informal learning and um, a course on it is not you know 
If they just have a course on it, it's not enough. So, um, and real, my claim is that, you know, um, the, the best practice is mentored live performance. Mm -hmm. There's only two problems with that is that live performance, if you screw up, you know, people die or something. <laughs> and the, the second side of that is individual mentoring doesn't scale well. So my claim is that the next best thing to individual live mentoring are essentially serious games. Simulations turned into scenarios with an end state that you're trying to achieve and a beginning state that means you won't get to that end state until you really understand it. And the exaggeration that's tuned it into a compelling and engaging experience. That's... Uh, that's what the real power of games is. And gamification is adding leaderboards and scores and stuff. And it can be done badly if you don't understand what you're doing. And you should only be doing that after you've tapped into the intrinsic motivation that comes from a meaningful story and meaningful tasks that really drive you to want to learn about this and accomplish it. Now, you know, that's, that's a great point, the story, the... You know, in the old days, we used to transmit knowledge through stories, generation to generation to generation. And in a company, same thing. The older employees would transmit the knowledge to the younger employees and so on. I remember my first job, I was at Citibank, and I was about 23 years old, and or for a serious job, I guess. Um, and the, the guy I worked for, he was probably around 50-ish. He had a lot of experience. So I was one of the people under his tutelage, if you will, to learn how to do certain things. Like I had to manage a billion dollar loan register. So he showed me how to manage the register, how to keep track of things, how to do things. In turn, other managers under him would show us different things. And, and you learn by basically their experience, from their experience. And it was a, an easy way to learn. There wasn't a lot of formal training, but the training was informally done and it worked pretty well. And, and again, he only had a department with about six, seven people. So it was easier to train six, seven people than training 100 or 200 or 1,000. Uh, so he didn't have to deal with the, the, the scope issue of training or the, 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 the multitudes to train. But we don't have a lot of that going on in some companies anymore. Um, and workforces are more transient. You know, you go to companies and you see people who've been there forever and people who have just barely started and they may not be there that long. So it's just an interesting thing that we're going through right now. What, what do you recommend for a company, for example, to, to train beginners and to keep them motivated and going inside of a company aside from just doing the rote same job forever? How, how do you keep them motivated? Well, I think it's by, uh, you know, the, Dan Pink wrote that book, A Drive. What mm -hmm. gets people motivated is giving them uh, a purpose, a vision about what they're doing how that contributes to the larger picture and how that larger picture is actually a contribution to the world as a whole. It's about uh, giving them autonomy, freedom to pursue it and support in acquiring that so that they can develop mastery. And I think once you create a culture where that's possible, people will share the stories. What we've done is made it you know, competitive. Oh, well, we want, you know, we're going to cut off the bottom performing people. So I'm not going to give away my secrets about how I do things because then somebody else would take it on and then I may be, you know, one of the ones cut. I think if you create a place where people can share stories and mm -hmm. help one another get better, they're going to want to stay and they're going to be sharing that stories and the companies that are doing this are succeeding. Right. Um, and, you know, we always, we're still learning through stories. It's just whether the stories are about how to succeed or what's wrong with our company and, mm -hmm. and how it's broken. And, you know, social media is a tool for this storytelling that can, makes it broader and we can listen to stories from different places and people in different roles. And if we start understanding the power of diversity, so, you know, those six and seven people, if they have complementary skills instead of redundant skills, the output of that group is going to be more powerful. We have lots of evidence about how this works well. We just need to start take, taking advantage of it. Right, right. And and, and there are ways, and there's, there's a lot of things. I, I've been noticing, we had on last week, um, Jennifer Zapp. I don't know if you know Jennifer. She's been around quite a while. Uh, and she works with Growth Engineering now, which has an LMS which uh, supports a lot of gamification as well as they support... Um, uh, social media right within the LMS. So it's not social media just to be social, but it's basically you can talk about courses you've taken, you can talk about projects you're on, which is it's nice that it's at that level. It's in, it's in an LMS. It actually makes the LMS a little bit more functional. Um, and I know Mazinga and several others do the same thing. 
What do you think about that, putting that at the LMS level, aside from just the strict, you know, the typical social media level? Um, I have a problem with it, and here's why. I, I have, you know, if people are talking about courses, instead you want to be having vibrant communities of practice. You want uh, the people in the different areas to be communicating. And those don't come from the LMS much, and we don't do that well. We don't say, okay, you've graduated from this course, you're now, you know, at, out at the periphery of this new, um, you know, community of practice, and let's introduce you to the community and segue over. Um, you could do that with the uh, integrated LMS, but I think you really want an enterprise social network. You want that to be the place where these are happening, and I'm not convinced that the the LMS social learning tools are the right mechanism for that because their DNA is wrong. They're not built around, you know, social and sharing. Because we have to understand is it's not just, you know, the formal courses and the social interaction. You know, there's powerful social interaction to happen around formal learning and there's powerful social interaction that happens task oriented. And so what you want to be doing is to uh, you know Segway that I almost argue you'd be better off using the enterprise social network to do the formal learning and bring people into the community than trying to use the one in the LMS. And what we're also missing is the role of the the portal, the SharePoint of resources, mm -hmm. where I can create things and share them, or or L and D can create things and share them, and members of the community can create things and share them, and they can be organized around the way people need it. So, you know, one of the problems is. I have this course, and the alternatives to the right answer are so dumb, I don't even have to know anything. That's at the formal learning level. Yeah. But at the, at the performance level, practitioner level, where I now know what I need to know and I know what it is, I'm searching for it and I can't find it. I've got portals, but I've got hundreds of them, and they're organized by the business unit, not by my needs. And I don't have good search and federated search across it. I can't find what I need. Mm -hmm. And then I can't find the people I need. And even if I can, they're not willing to help because it's not a sharing culture. These are the types of problems we need to break down, and I think you need the right tool for the job in each of those categories, not necessarily trying to find, again, an all singing, all dancing. So what, what kind of tools do you recommend for, for the enterprise social media? Because a lot of companies don't want the Twitters or the Facebooks coming in. Um, oh, no. So what, what do you recommend? Any, any specific tools? Uh, you know, I don't know all the tools, but I'm a member of Change Agents Worldwide, which is all about um, helping people transform their organizations through enterprise social networks to become these sorts of cultures where things are effective. And, you know, enterprise social tools that are like a Facebook or, or LinkedIn or something, but they're internal, a Jive, a social cast, a social text, these are the sorts of types of tools that you want to be sorting out, figuring which one meets your needs, and getting it in, in, inside the firewall if necessary. I understand the need for you know organizational security. There's some stuff you want to sure. share and some stuff you may need to keep proprietary till you set a state you're ready to take it to the market. Now, now how um, do you get people? Now, we've, we've had some experience with this, and it's been tricky getting people to, well, even though you have an internal social media or you've got internal um, forums or whatever else, how do you get people to participate? Uh, um, and I heard somebody just telling a story about how their consultants on this said gamification, and I'm just barking mad. Um, <laughs> you have they're going to come when they find value, and so I have a sort of a agricultural um, metaphor. I you know for networks to work, you need to seed it, and that means you know get it in place, but then be uh, feeding it. With you know, you have to. You may have to incent certain people to go in and participate and nurture people's participation. Don't assume that people know how to work and play well together. Yeah. You, meta learning is arguably the best investment. The learning to learn, learning to work and play together, may be the best investment an organization can make. And then you weed it because there'll be people who you know are trolls or don't know how to behave, and you have to moderate that behavior. But when you seed, feed, and weed until you get a vibrant, self-sustaining network, then you can breed it and carry it over. But it, it, if you build it, it is good, it's just wrong. It's going to need active facilitation. And it's, it's, we have a lot of good rubrics and heuristics. I don't think there's an algorithm right now. Right. That's, it's an ongoing process. But it really makes sense what you said about getting certain people to create that conversation, create, uh, incentivize others to join. Because mm -hmm. you're right, we've, and operational we've units. Back to a point you made earlier, Rick, where you said you know the operational units are the ones who are seeing this this power, this effectiveness. 
they are um, using these networks and people are creating their own resources, capturing how to do's with little video clips from their desktop or um, capturing their best performances on video and sharing it. These are things that are happening and yet L&D is in some sense completely oblivious of it or at least just seeing it happen and wondering what's our role. And yet there's a very important role for L&D in all this. Yeah, there is. Um probably one that hasn't yet, like you said, been manifested, at least correctly in many cases. Um, when's your book coming out, the new one? Um, end of this month. Oh, great. Um, okay. And I, you keep putting up the Quinovation site. I wish I could get you to put up the revolutionizeLND.com site so people could see that there's a site for the book as well. But <laughs> it's, um, there is a book for that. It's not available yet. It's available for pre-order. Um, and that's and, revolutionized uh, the LND. Amazon already has the look inside, so you can check it out. And okay. And what is the name of the new book? Revolutionize Learning and Development. And then there's a subtitle, Innovation and performance strategy for the information age. Okay. You know, the point is, you know, we're moving from an industrial economy to information age. Let's L and D can catch up too. And, and I don't say it because he's here, but I have read his books. They're great books. So if you if you haven't read Clark's books, read them. You're missing out. He's actually very innovative in his approaches, and um, there's a lot of books written on e-learning and other things on learning in the whole, which tend to be. Uh, Kind of boring. Um, <laughs> Clark writes good books. They're they're actually interesting. I actually wind up reading it for quite a while, extended periods, and getting my attention for a long time is difficult sometimes. So, um, I, I I really yeah, enjoy your books. You do a good job. So I'm looking forward to to reading this one when it comes out. Um, Thank you. Rick. Always always good to stimulate thoughts and. Um, every time I meet you, I always come up with something new. Um, we've been struggling with the idea of how do you get people to communicate more with each other in a company. And I think you said the one key word, which is incentivize others to do that, to bring people in. And it makes sense. Get that Pied Piper thing going and get others to join and, and become part of the network, and then they'll enjoy it. You know, I, I know a lot of people who say, oh, I don't want to do Twitter. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. And then they get into it and they go, hey, it's kind of fun. And not only that, it's, it's very passive and dynamic learning. It's both. And indeed, and there's some skills involved. So you, but mm -hmm. that's my message in one sense to L&D. The, the cultural thing is you've got to start experimenting with the tools yourself to bring this value out to others. You know, you should be going to LinkedIn and joining in relevant groups and listening to the conversations. You should get into Twitter and figure out who to follow so you start getting pointed to interesting things. These are the tools that people are finding advantage with and you can be doing that as well. And you have to understand how that works before you can help others do it. So, yeah, no, that's definitely, that's definitely a, a good point. And, um, before we wrap up, how, how's the, uh, serious manifesto going? Great. We're having uh, continual, uh, people, uh, signing up and we're getting a number of people, uh, you know, blogging about it in various different ways. And, yeah, it was a volunteer effort. The, the four of us came together and put a lot of effort to get it there, you know, and, you know, we all have lives as well. So it was hard work. And then we had to go through all the exercises to get it launched. And now we're sort of collapsed going, OK, <laughs> let's watch and see, you know, how much life it gets and what are we going to do to kick it along without, you know, <laughs> getting back to all the things we put on hold while we were doing this. Yeah. So we're um, uh, slowly kicking along, but hoping to see signs of, you know, self-sustaining uh, discussion and we're seeing and a lot of people are kicking in and helping and, and so we're really gratified to see it and we're just hoping it actually will lead to a ch improvement some people have complained that we're closing off the ceiling no we're just trying to raise the floor yeah, i agree Fig that's, that's I, don't, I don't see it closing anything off i think it's if, if anything it's a, a pointer saying hey guys wake up we got to do some stuff um because it's only if we get it's only going to get worse if we let it continue the way it's going and um and I hear from companies all the time, our, our training sucks. Well, what are you doing to fix it? Well, we're getting new trainers. <laughs> That's not going to necessarily <laughs> fix it. Uh, that, that doesn't exactly solve the problem. You're probably just going to get the same kind of people who are trying their darndest to do a good job, but either don't have the tools or the budget to do so. Well, tools, budget, time, cooperation from management, whatever. There's a lot of reasons why training is bad in, in many cases. Um, so that's a, that's. And measure, just measuring whether people like it 
is not a good no. evaluation mechanism. Oh, we've yeah. got high rated trainers. Yeah. Is it leading to any improvement in the business? There can be people who are really personable and make great training events that lead to no impact at all. Well, no, and, I've heard that a lot when you get trainers that are very funny and people go, they were great. It was funny. We had a good time. Well, the person was doing stand-up comedy, but they weren't really doing training. <laughs> so that, I mean, yeah, entertain people, but also get something going. That's a, that's a key mm -hmm. key Im improvement thing. Um, well, Clark, as always, it's been a pleasure having you here today. We're glad you could make it. I know you're busy. And um, are you going to be at any shows coming up soon? I am. I'm going to be at uh, ASUD's International Conference. I'll be talking about the book there. We have a manifesto session, I think, uh, right. there as well. That's in May. Um, and then MLearnCon. Uh, okay. While you know, I'm I'm looking at this bigger picture. Mobile learning. If you look at the cover of the book, you know, a hand holding the mobile phone. And it's not a mm -hmm. book about mobile, but mobile is a catalyst for change right. in in an interesting way. And I think, you know, I I just. Uh, wrote a post about this it'll be out in a, in a bit for somebody but mobile uh you know a lot of things you remember virtual worlds right there's mm -hmm. this the gartner hype cycle there's this burst of excitement and all this hype and then it falls away when they realize it doesn't live up to the hype and then gradually you find the real stuff yep mobile sort of skipping that because they're literally in everybody's hand there's such a fundamental augmentation of our intellect the digital technology does well what our brains don't and vice versa, so mm -hmm. they're a perfect complement. Having that wherever and whenever you are is just a real value proposition that's not, that seems Im <laughs> impermeable to, um, to hype. And, yeah. you know, everybody's got them now. You know, I could ask the audience listening to this, pull out, show me your mobile device and they'll have one. Oh, yeah. And so... Yeah. They may I, actually be on it right now, but... Well, that's it. Yeah, they might be watching it this way right now. Exactly. And that's the point that you know mobile's here to stay, and it's time to get there. And so, MLearnCon is another great place to be to to get your mind around it because it's not going away. That sounds great. I'll probably see it. I'm learning. I'm going to be there just at the expo, but look forward to seeing oh, you there. Well, great. I'll look forward to seeing you there, Rick. Sounds good. Okay. Well, for all you guys watching in the chat room, we didn't have a moderator today. We had Leva for a while, but unfortunately, she got disconnected. Not sure what happened there. Um, thanks for being there. And if you're watching the recordings, please subscribe. Give us your feedback always want to hear from you and anything we can do to make the show better we will we're going to be doing probably two shows a week starting next week we're getting a lot of people want to come on so we don't you know, we've got people scheduled out through may so we figured why wait that long we'll do two shows it'll be a little bit more fun we've got brent schlenker coming on uh, next thursday and oh who is on next week i don't recall right now but it's another one of the manifesto rebels so they're going to be oh. on so that'll be fun well, Clark, again, a pleasure seeing you again. I'll see you soon at one of the shows, and good luck on the book. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading it. Thank you very much, Rick, and thanks to all of you who were watching. I look forward to comments and any feedback, but uh, good luck to you, and thanks, Rick. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Mm -hmm.